Uh, okay, so so let's see. So let's go ahead and get started since we are so late. Um, so some of my classes, uh, was it all of my classes? Yes, it was all of my classes yesterday. We we took a look at your uh, your website and we started to explore your body of work. Um, we one class, my morning class, we did watch the video um, with all of the different movie clips. Yeah. Um, and then some of our other classes, we were looking at your body of work called Rise. Um, and with David, we were talking about cloning and Photoshop and lots of great, great conversations came up. Um, um, but so, so my students have a little familiarity with your work, but I'd like you to just um, take it away. And I don't want to, I don't want to speak for you anymore because we have mm -hmm. ears. <laughs> okay. Should I um, share some images? Yes, that would be great. And I, I know you gave me Actually, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself before you um, start sharing the screen? Oh, sure. Um, hello again, everyone. My name is uh, Jeremy Dennis. I'm from uh, Southampton, New York, out in uh, Suffolk County. Uh, I grew up um, and still live on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation. And um, I'm part of a very small community of uh, indigenous people. Um, we have maybe about 600 people total on this 800 square acre um, reservation out here. Um, ever since uh, high school, I've been doing studio art, uh, painting, printmaking, um, but I really got into photography just because uh, I love uh, portraits. I love uh, talking to people, meeting new people. And um, I, I think I'm still a, bit, a, sh a shy person now, but um, photography is a good way to meet new people and just have an excuse to uh, kind of sit down and introduce yourself. That's cool. Question, was um, Alexis Martino your, your teacher? Oh, yeah. I, um, I failed her photo class in high school. <laughs> but, you did not! Yeah. Okay, uh, so I, know, I know Jeremy because I used to work at the high school that he graduated from. And um, your, your photography teacher, she and I went to Parsons School of Design at the same time and we graduated, um, I think a year apart, but she was in the photo department, I was in the fine art department. Um, but so that's amazing that you, um, you took photography that's in high school oh. yeah, and nailed it. Yeah, we had um, a great experience in high school um, since Alexis was a photographer mm -hmm. herself. So uh, she had some of her artwork in the hallway it was like a nice small class, but I was so intimidated by that large format camera. So <laughs> that was the part that got me. Oh, she was using a camera that that you weren't into. Yeah, um, we all know like those small 35 millimeters or the Polaroids or the disposable ones, but we had uh, this huge one that you put the curtain over your head and it was film and <laughs> I was too intimidated by that. Oh, wow. Oh, I've seen that one before. So what kind of camera do you use now? Uh, today I use the uh, Canon uh, 5D for my photography. So that's great for um, just doing a lot of the um, flexible work I do if it's commercial or fine art. And then it allows you to print pretty large uh, images, um, I guess compared to like a cell phone or something. Right. I saw, um, I saw a really enormous picture that I, 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 I accidentally went to this barn art exhibit a few years ago and um, I walked in and there was a whole exhibit of Jeremy's work and one of the photographs was printed, um, I think he told me 10 feet by 14, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. It was so absolutely impressive and overwhelming um, in addition to all of the other shots, but why don't you take it away now and, and uh, show us what you wanna show us. All right, um, I know you gave me uh, 20 minutes originally without the, uh, tech issues uh should i still do like 10 or 15 minute showing well we actually have so it's 9 40 um some of my students um are going to um period two is now over so some students are going to have to go to their period three classes but those of you that are in attendance um if you can stay until the end of period three which is 10 25 i will uh write your your teacher a note that you are here 
and um, yeah, let's let's stay till till twenty five if you have the time. <laughs> All right, cool. I'll try to uh, share my screen and then we could talk about some images. Um, so this is the uh, I'll make it full screen. Hopefully that didn't screw everything up. But um, this is the uh, 10 by 14 uh, image that was printed uh, large on vinyl. And this is one of the images I'm really uh, known for. It comes from Native American creation stories. And um, so far I uh, pursued and kind of created uh, 100 of these stories, uh, even though in Native American myth and in uh, cultures around the world, there's really a story for everything. That's their uh, true purpose, just to be uh, allegory or some sort of symbolic narrative that uh, transforms the listener or transforms the main character. And so just to give a brief uh, background behind this image, um, Choknanipak, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor, um, is this large rock figure. And his brother, um, Manabozo in the foreground is kind of the uh, good brother. And so, um, kind of like the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, these two were kind of like the first major um, people on earth at the time or uh, Turtle Island. And so one of them represented like evil. Um, he created all the uh, valleys and mountains, uh, snakes and other terrible things. Um, the other good brother taught humans how to live. And so what's happening in the scene is um, they've been living for a long time on earth um, they kind of have to fight each other because they're just uh, clashing all the time. And eventually the good brother wins um, by chipping away rocks at, on his uh, older brother's body. And this sort of explains why um, when you like walk out in the woods, you can just find rocks everywhere. It's kind of an aftermath of that huge long battle. Um, so I really love when you're able to um, link the past to the present and just kind of point out the uh, sacredness of everything. <clears throat> Um, this is a map by David Van Martin, a fellow Shinnecock uh, artist. Um, and I, I do want to kind of start with a uh, land acknowledgement. Um, out west is uh, Canarsie land where uh, the high school is located. And it's good to do these um, land acknowledgements whenever possible because um, it kind of reminds us of the land disposition of indigenous people and the continue continued uh, displacement of native people. And um, we, we should uh, kind of acknowledge the gift of land and the land use that we have today and remember to give whenever possible too. Um, <laughs> my, my voice is a little bit scratchy. Huh? Get some liquids. So this is the uh, Shinnecock Tribal um, Community Center here on the reservation and the uh, tribal seal on the bottom right. And so this is where we uh, usually have a lot of our um, gatherings, political uh, meetings, um, social events. Um, due to COVID, it's kind of been um, closed down and only for emergencies. But on the bottom right, if we uh, take a closer look, there's so much symbology behind who we are as a Shinnecock people. We're one of over 580 unique federally recognized tribes in the United States, which means that um, in our case, after 30 years of petitioning to the uh, federal government, um, we, we kind of, we finally got that proof that we exist as a people, um, that we've had this long legacy of um, connection to the land. Um, I like to tell people we've been here for 10,000 years, which is uh, incredible. But um, on the flag itself, we can kind of see right whales because we were whalers. There's a, a turtle in the center with 13 tiles on the back representing the 13 tribes of Long Island. And then everything else is um, really symbolic to who we are as a people. Um, I thought I would share one uh, landscape here on the reservation since um, I, I assume many of you are from Brooklyn and it probably looks much, much different. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the Hamptons, we have a lot of um, McMansions as I call them, the rich people's huge estates that um, are just all along the waterways, but shooting a uh, landscape photo from Shinnecock side of the water you can just see how um, beautiful and preserved and how we live in balance with uh, our local environment. And um, as we learned from Hurricane Sandy years ago, these kind of grasslands and marshes are so essential for um, absorbing stormwater. And so we, um, we're learning a lot, we're sharing what we learned. And I think Southampton town, our neighbors are learning as well. 
Um, I do want to quickly go through some of my influences just because um, I didn't start <laughs> with a uh, body of work that was amazing. I, I kind of built up and um, a lot of these photographers are kind of in the same realm of the work that I like to do, which is um, using artificial light or off-camera lighting to create these um, kind of stills that look like they're, they're straight from a uh, movie. So if we look at uh, the next one by Gregory Kutzen, this looks like it could be from a um, feature film or a motion picture, just by the way it's uh, lit, by the way everything is like perfectly framed. It doesn't really look like um, he just wandered into the frame and took that photograph. Um, this is a lesser known artist named Anthony Goicola, who um, since you're talking about cloning before, um, if you really like that idea, this is where I kind of learned about that possibility. So all of these different individuals are him um, using multiple exposures. And then he just edited it himself into the uh, same image. Um, Jeff Wall is another great influence of mine. Um, this this kind of looks like he was just on the sidewalk and he took a quick snapshot. But what he does in his work is he um, kind of takes his memories or his personal experiences. He hires actors and then he goes back on location and kind of does like the beautiful off-camera lighting and um, sets, it all, sets it all up. Um, and before I get into my personal photography, I like to show this uh, printmaking image I did back in 2011. Um, before I got into photography, like I said before, I was doing illustration, um, kind of representational painting. And this became really essential for um, my later work because um, there's so much editing involved yeah. in um, trying to blend in those different kind of cloned figures or um, when you're doing post-production in Photoshop, you have to know how light works, you have to know how shadows work. And so um, this practice really helped me for sure. Um, and then I'll quickly go through some of my uh, college work. This is a book called uh, Fear. And um, all throughout Long Island, there's all these kind of like historic, um, some on the reservation uh, abandoned sites that I, <laughs> I was personally really scared of, but um, having my camera there, um, doing a little bit of research helped me overcome um, some of the fear of these places. And I think that um, so many early photographers just really love to <laughs> photograph abandoned places. But since my influences were um, all portrait photographers, I kind of felt a need to incorporate myself. Um, this is a nice um, image I really like. This is in my uh, bedroom. It's kind of like playing around with dreams, um, some things in my imagination. Um, this one's a funny image because I went to um, college with two twins and then we kind of just duplicated them uh, kind of three more times to create this image um, from dreams. But um, when I went to school, I, uh, I had to fulfill the art history requirement. Um, and I, I yeah. was, which school did you go to? Oh, I went to uh, Stony Brook University, the uh, SUNY school. And so I went there for uh, art history. I think it was um, 2013, I graduated. And so um, I really love art and studio art, but one of the requirements is uh, art history. And this is kind of like the typical, what we learn, what, what is the greatest art? Um, <laughs> and so I kind of um, That's fell in. This picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, f I fell in love with um, technically what they were doing, like narrative uh, storytelling, but it's, it looks like a lot of like um, Westernized stories it looks like mostly Jesus and his greatness, um, a white Jesus as well. <laughs> and so I was uh, hoping to find more based on Native American kind of creation stories, which I uh, really desire to see. Um, Were you surprised when you started learning art history at college? Were you surprised at, at what was missing from that picture? Um, I would say at the time, it, it wasn't even something that I uh, realized. I think it was later on, um, the more I read like art criticism and um, contemporary art, I think the movement that we're in today in 2020 was kind of like really escalating uh, to where we are. And so um, one of my professors- I mean, I what movement you're, you're referring to, but can you, can you just articulate that for my students in case they don't know? I mean, they know, but- <laughs> Oh, sure. 
Um, I think museums today are really um, kind of stepping back and reevaluating their mission, their purpose, because so many um, art collections kind of look like this <laughs> grid of images. Um, it's either um, artwork of kind of like white people or artists, uh, male artists in the uh, collections. And this is just after uh, decades and um, decades of art collection, art collecting and who benefits from those sales, who benefits from investing in those artists. And so um, I didn't kind of make those connections when I was in school. It's much more um, kind of, if you look around today, you could just see that everywhere, just the transformation happening. So it's really a good time to be an artist as well. Um, <clears throat> one of my uh, professors in uh, college was Howardina Pindell, uh, the uh, painter. And so I'm so happy that she's getting more recognition now, for example. Um, this is a uh, photograph of um, the Freedom Summer in Mississippi by uh, one of my relatives and mentors, uh, Herbert Randall. Um, he lives on the Shinnecock Reservation, but in the 60s, he actually smuggled himself down uh, to Mississippi under a blanket um, in the back of a car because um, that was kind of like the height of uh, segregation and Jim Crow. And um, unfortunately, the lynching is still going on today. But um, back then, um, well, I guess comparab comparably, um, there is such little consequence for violence against uh, Black people. But um, back in the 60s, people were shooting at the car, uh, the cars that had um, black um, riders in them. And so he kind of um, went down. This is one of the um, kind of documentary images that he took, but he just has a, a huge collection and I look up to him. But he lives down the road from me and I, I kind of got that special one on one with him um, learning photography. And so this is one of my images at the uh, Shinnecock powwow. Um, one of his uh, greatest advice is he told me um, as a shy photographer, I, I sort of asked him, um, what should I be taking photos of? Like, how do I get people to say yes to um, me taking their portrait? And he said, go to places where people expect you to take photos, go to festivals, go to parties. Um, we luckily at Shinnecock, we have the annual Labor Day weekend powwow, which I invite you all to attend uh, hopefully next year. But um, this is a time where I have a sense of belonging. I can kind of go up to the dancers up on the stage and I kind of um, feel like I'm not trespassing or crossing any bounds. Um, this is another photograph from the Narragansett powwow in uh, Rhode Island. And I was very lucky to have my godfather, Keith Phillips, as one of the um, uh, competitive dancers that went on the powwow trail, as they call it. And so I followed him we went through um, all the New England powwows, there's probably at least 12 in total. And um, I just basically kept photographing all the uh, traditional dancers. Um, this, this is called the um, traditional Eastern war dancers. So you can see that they adorn themselves with regalia that looks like it's from the pre-contact period, which is uh, so amazing. And so going back to that first image, what I ended up doing was um, combining my um, kind of like interest in biblical stories, um, spirituality, mythology. And um, this is actually one of the powwow dancers covered in um, rock textures. And I'm sure in uh, your Photoshop classes, you learn how to combine like textures and elements and colors. And so this is uh, just using that same style of like using a brush for smoke, cutting out these figures and placing them into new landscapes. Um, this is actually my backyard here at the <laughs> reservation. So just another uh, marshland here. Um, this is another image um, for that project that I really love. Um, it, it pulls from art history. And the reason I really love to do this um, is because, um, like I said before, I, I didn't really see um, native uh, imagery in my art history classes. So in one sense, I wanted to remix what I was already seeing and what was already celebrated because there's just a consensus that this is um, great visually or great compositionally. And then, um, of course, the history of uh, colonization, there's a great disruption, there's a great displacement of Native people. And so in a way, it's kind of like going back to those hundreds of years where we should have been producing um, 
kind of cultural things and um, ways of expression. And a lot of our objects and um, cultural sites have been destroyed. So it's kind of a revisiting of those uh, sacred things. Um, Can any of my students um, tell me, can you go back one slide for a moment? Mm -hmm. Can any of my students um, tell me uh, what Jeremy did here by recreating this classical painting and putting in Native Americans in the same pose, does this, does this concept, this technique, does it remind you of a contemporary black painter that we have um, discussed in class and, and whose who's hint, who is from Brooklyn? Anyone? Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I'm thinking of Kehinde Wiley, right? Kehinde Wiley, um, in his painting, um, has, has done the same thing, right? But not in photography. He's done it with, with oil paint, really large paintings, and takes classical paintings and, and, and puts his people in there, puts the black culture in there because that's another, another culture that has been completely absent and from, from art history. Exactly. Um, he has a really great image um, he did by, um, I think it's uh, Jacques-Louis David as well of Napoleon riding the horse and it's kind of um, yes. jumping in the air a little bit. Um, so he's a big influence of mine as well. But um, well, this is a good example on the left. This is my digital notebook of uh, ideas. And so you can see El Greco from the uh, 16th century. I uh, pulled from that image as well to represent one of our local uh, Long Island native stories. Um, this is uh, Pagaticit in the center um, during his funerary procession. And so if you're uh, familiar with Suffolk County, we have uh, Shelter Island um, towards the end and Montauk all the way at the end of the island. And so at the time of his uh, death, they actually brought him on foot from Shelter Island all the way to uh, Montauk, which is an incredible journey. And so um, a lot of my influences, I uh, copy down their images. I take a screenshot if it's like from Instagram and just add it to this notebook. So it's ever growing and I constantly have new uh, ideas to pull from. I have a question about that, um, that digital notebook. So many students here are seniors and they are taking, uh, we're, we are taking an AP art course mm. where documentation of their process is not only required, but um, so, so my question about this is, do you only maintain a digital notebook or do you also have a sketchbook to, to carry your ideas? you know, an analog sketchbook, a real. <laughs> oh, um, well, the cool thing about uh, this program, it's called Microsoft OneNote, is that um, if you have a digital stylus, um, you could probably get one for like $50 at this point. Um, you can actually uh, use a pen to draw in that digital sketchbook. And so um, that's what I do because I also have a phone with one of those um, kind of soft edge styluses as well. So you can actually sync up your notes between your computer, your tablet, your phone. And um, OneNote is also free as an app on uh, if you have Android or Apple phones. And so it's just a good way to um, keep all your ideas with you um, and keep all your sources and references and images. So I, I, trans, I uh, transferred from using paper and pen uh, for better or worse. <laughs> wow, so you just need a, um, a tablet. Mm -hmm. We actually have so many tablets um, in our classroom. So that's that's cool. So Microsoft OneNote. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I asked that sure. <laughs> I, I never used it in uh, classroom settings, but I'm sure you can like uh, share it and just um, be able to see each other's notes or something or just have a combined note, which is so cool. Um, and then I have another project called Behind the Dance. Um, I think since you all are so close to Brooklyn, you probably know Humans of New York on Facebook. And so um, one of the projects I did sort of self-criticizing myself for the uh, mythology work 
is based on um, just documentary style portraits, uh, interviews, um, and just going out to uh, powwows and um, asking attendees to um, maybe just chat for a minute or two. And some people would give me these huge stories and be very candid. Other people would just give a single quote because they just got finished dancing in competition. Um, this is uh, Tichin, who was a native storyteller. And um, he was such a uh, <laughs> interesting person to talk to. Uh, everyone that like passed by, he would just say hello and acted like he, he knew them somehow. <laughs> so um, I just want to share that one uh, portrait from that series. Um, a different project I'm still working on since 2016 uh, looks at Long Island's Native American history. Um, this is a project that I received uh, funding for. Um, originally, I, I received $10,000 to um, allow me to travel, allow me to get equipment, um, to kind of uh, have an archive website. Um, and what I was uh, aiming to do with this 2016 project was um, document um, sacred sites throughout Long Island, New York, as they pertain to uh, indigenous and native uh, history. And so there's uh, at least a thousand sites that I still have to <laughs> go out and photograph, but um, it seems like uh, with COVID and travel restrictions, I'm going to be uh, waiting until next spring at least to continue this work. But I want to show you just a handful of uh, images I took since uh, 2016. Um, this is Sugarloaf Hill. Uh, on the top right, we can see a little uh, white house. And beneath that house was um, once a 3,000 year old uh, burial site that was uh, largely destroyed in the 1990s, unfortunately. Um, this next image is the uh, Puspatuck Indian Reservation, their mm -hmm. community center. And um, this is in uh, Mastic, New York. And so the point I'm making is that it's not just these very old sites that you can't see anything. Um, it's also places that we still uh, live today and um, continue our presence. Um, I think it was back in the 90s too, the uh, Last of the Mohicans film came out. And so in a lot of my research, I come across these uh, articles that um, like whenever someone from Shinnecock would pass away, the local newspaper would say the last of the Shinnecock or the last of the full-blooded native person of that tribe. <laughs> um, I think it was kind of like wishful thinking because um, with colonization, there's just so much guilt um, living on the land you live on. Um, there's just a lot of um, hard to acknowledge histories in American history. And so um, oftentimes um, there's different manif manifestations of trying to either um, deal with this difficult history um, sometimes it's through these articles that people say we're no longer here. Other times it's through um, sports mascots. And so um, people, um, high schools, um, football teams try to honor us by um, having these uh, Native American mascots. But in reality, what they're saying is that we're no longer here. The only thing that can um, be here in their, um, sub in their uh, substitute is these uh, kind of icons <laughs> on our team's um, jerseys. Um, this is another uh, really beautiful image here next to Shinnecock. Um, sometimes when these sites are so sacred, they become uh, preserved. And if you're unfamiliar with the East End's uh, economy, so much of what we um, get taxes and income for is uh, real estate and uh, house development. And so it's really incredible to think that some of these really um, desired and valuable uh, plots of land get preserved by our local town because of their significance to uh, native culture. And this, this is one of those sites, uh, Parish Pond. Um, just going back to the um, kind of goal or to-do list of the project, um, you can see out in uh, Brooklyn or Canarsie land, <laughs> there's just like at least 200 sites out there. Um, the ones that are in green and blue are the ones I already put into the project. And so since I'm based out here in Southampton, I kind of have a uh, radius of sites that I already included. It's amazing um, how many sites are in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. I, I find that surprising. Do, did, did, did any of my, my students who live in Brooklyn, did you know that? Yeah, I actually live in Canarsie. So um, 
I know there's a piece of land that's still there that they haven't touched over on Clarendon and Ralph Avenue. Are you familiar with that spot right there? Oh, no, Marsha, you'll have to uh, email me. <laughs> I'll have to add that to the map. Yeah, that, that um, it's actually a home that they never, they never actually touched. It's mm. right there at the corner of Clarendon. Yeah, Clarendon and Ralph Avenue. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's so much I need to um, add. So that's just an example of like how how, how many more that I don't even have on this map. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. And then in uh, Flesh and Queens, there's a small Matinicock uh, community that still lives there today. And so um, I, I hope to work with them to also kind of fill in that area around Flushing too. Um, and so this project went on for um, until the present actually. So I'm still uh working on that project but i want to show you um nothing happened here i'll try to go through it very quickly um i attended a uh, residency up in vermont which gave me one month stay and a uh, artist studio up in uh, johnson vermont and what i wanted to do with my time there is work with uh other artists or volunteers to create a body of work that proposes the question um since we're not going to acknowledge uh, Native history here in America, um, how, do, how can these images kind of um, reflect that um, kind of omission of history or overlooking of history? And so these images um, kind of show these maybe indigenous arrows impaling these people who almost have like a blank face or um, almost in that contemplative state. Um, in some cases, there's a, there's even like arrows that aren't even inside the body. Um, you have to kind of guess if they're entering or leaving the body. And so this project is just all about um, kind of using this shocking imagery to um, use as the entry point into this um, other project on this site. So it's kind of showing like if nothing's happening to these people, maybe that's true for um, Native history as well, but of course, neither of those are true. Um, so in a way, these arrows represent kind of a burden of history, kind of something that we're trying to ignore somehow. Um, I want to show you behind the scene how these are made. <laughs> so that's my friend, uh, George, and um, I had my camera on a tripod. And every couple of seconds, he would take a photograph. And I would just kind of poke him maybe two dozen times with the arrows to uh, create that illusion that he was uh, filled with him. And so I think this arrow is actually the one in the foreground there. And then the cool thing about Photoshop is that you could just pick the best expression and combine it later on. Um, and so that's nothing happened here, just, just two images from that series. Looking at that in class yesterday, that series, and we were all talking about um, I was asking my students, why do you think these white people have no expression and they're just hanging out on the lawn like nothing's happening and and um do any of my students um want to share with jeremy um what ideas we came up with yesterday like about specifically any any of the ideas that we were talking about like why all those white people are laying there like just chilling out How about, let's see, who's in class? How about, um, how about David? David Lewis, mm -hmm. are you there? Yeah. What, what were you telling me yesterday when I, when I was asking you questions about all these white people with all these arrows and, and the people, ha they don't look like they're in pain. They don't look like they're suffering. Some, some of them, those guys, like there was a guy on a bike, he was smiling. What did you say about that yesterday? That they, that they were trespassing. Oh. I don't know. Oh yeah, we were talking about the trespassing picture in the in the Rise series. Hmm. I think it has to do with, with no matter what the Indians do, the the men the men always wants to take their land. Oh man, no matter what the Indians do. Hmm. What else, what else did you say yesterday? You came up with really great, great thoughts, great ideas. 
I said that they could be, I said something about how the Indians found, said that nobody owns the land. Really? Yes, explain that again. What, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think they mean by that, that nobody owns the land? Like the land, like you said, the land is supposed to be considered like sacred, like the Native Americans, they have some land and they preserve them. And do you think that the that the Native Americans believe that they were owners of the land or that they No, they did not believe they were owners of the land. Why not? Mm. Who is the land for? It probably belongs to the animals, to the spirits, to the It didn't really belong to anyone. It was just a land for all of them to share, all of them, for all of them to take care of and enjoy. Exactly, it's 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 for all of us, and 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 nobody really should be should should own it, right? And what happens when what ha what's been happening to the land, in your opinion or in anyone's opinion? Um, what's been happening to the land now that people, white people, have been owning it? And, uh, the so, land. The land was is being built over. And what else? What else do you guys think happens to to our environment as a result of home ownership and what happens to the to our water? Just throw some ideas out there. It's not it's not a right or wrong. You can just you can just guess. I hear David. Ever since, ever since they took over the land, land there been pollution, shin, and they've been like cutting down all the trees, kicking kicking out the wildlife that lived on there, and building buildings all over it. Yep. Exactly right. Thank you, David. <laughs> so, 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 so we had such rich, really rich conversations yesterday um, talking about this series, Nothing Happened Here. Mm -hmm. And then the next one, which I see that you were just about to go into, mm -hmm. um, this also prompted great conversation. So, mm. Take it away. I just I, I totally <laughs> I'm gonna, Ms. Brooks, I'm sorry. I put in the link for the website of the, the home and uh, the land that's actually preserved yeah. over in Canarsie. So if you Thank wanted you. to just check it out. Because they, they actually that. turned it into a museum. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both. No um, and just like David said, um, I guess for nothing happened here and for Rise, it is a little bit about um, trespass as a theme. Um, kind of occupation like who's who really belongs who's really trespassing uh, in the rise series these are again self-portraits of myself in the traditional leather regalia wow and, i didn't know they were that was you oh yeah these are just me in a wig I had no idea that was you that adds a whole new layer of coolness <laughs> sometimes I, I wonder if i should reveal it or just keep it mystery but um i like to just point that out just for technical or behind the scenes but on the uh, surface, maybe with this image alone, it kind of looks like this woman's just having a moment of tea in the evening. And it looks like these um, native people are like on the wrong side of the uh, fence or <laughs> uh, trespassing on her That's land. That's a pretty dope picture. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Marsha. You're welcome. Um, I love this one. Um, I'm only going to include a handful from this series because these are some of my favorites. Um, I see your connection to Cindy Sherman. Oh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. And um, this is another one from Rise, um, kind of playing on that whole Halloween theme of um, ghosts and scaring people and popping out from behind trees. Um, a big part of this project is also uh, fear, just the concept of fear. And I think that um, with um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, in 2020 and the police violence we're seeing, um, I think a lot of that can be traced back to um, the colonial period in the 16th and 17th century, and then the um, slave rebellions and the uh, civil war, and the fear that um, like 
such horrible things have happened to these uh, communities of color that one day they might rise up and do something um, about it. Um, I love uh, James Baldwin. He has a great interview that, um, <laughs> well, James Baldwin's uh, interviews are just so funny because it's always like uh, the host is wondering like all these terrible violent things about black people. And he's just like, no, I don't want to, I don't really want to do that. So um, it's kind of in that same vein of that fear that, persist even though um, that's not the truth and so um, one of the uh, books that I really refer to just for on a local level is something called we have we are uh, still here by John Strong um, this is a book of some of our current day like political economic social aspirations and a lot of people on the cover are still alive today this was published I think in the 1990s and so just that simple message, we are still here is uh, so essential to my work. And that's just one thing to take away, <laughs> if anything, from this presentation. Um, here's another from the series Rise with one of my illustrations on the top left. Um, this is one of my absolute favorites because even though I'm dealing with such um, difficult uh, themes and histories, um, this image in itself kind of looks like it's from a dream or some sort of absurdity is happening like, why is there a yeah, burnt out tree on the middle of a beach, <laughs> kind of in the middle of nowhere? It's kind of like those uh, cliches of horror movies when the main character gets stuck under um, some uh, trivial thing or stuck in a power cord or something. Um, so I really love this image. Um, and in addition- Great. I, I heard an interview by this uh, author, Layla Taylor. She just wrote a book called Darkly. And she talks about um, she talks about horror movies as as a way for processing trauma mm -hmm. and anxiety, um, and in in relationship to um, mm -hmm. you know, generational deal with what? Mm. Yeah. What, what was that book called again? Um, the book is called Darkly, D A R K L Y by Layla Taylor. I think is her last name, uh, but you know. Obviously, she talks about like the movie Get Out mm. and, um, you know, issues of race and how do we, how do you process that, that trauma? Have you ever heard? Acknowledge it. Mm. Have you ever heard of that movie called Tales from the Hood? The first one? No. <laughs> yes, I have. And actually the, the author interview with Layla Taylor, she talks about that too. She talks about Tales of the Hood and and and, and that's the exact theme that we are talking about. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. I actually seen it. What did you think about? Wh why, did you ask, why did you ask us if we saw Tales from the Hood? Because Tales from the Hood, it actually mentions about problems that are happening, that are hap the problems that the black community encounters black like police brutality the gang violence violence and that stuff mm. so including racism yeah. in fact like in fact there's this one story that i found very interesting tell me okay so the story starts like when like when there was this like there was this rookie black cop and then he responded, and then he and his partner, who was white, responded to this, to this call in a in a quiet neighborhood. And then they found out that this, that this governor who was black, who who vowed to take down corrupt cops, cops was getting beaten, and very harshly. Mm -hmm. The so the rookie he tried to stop stop the two cops from beating them, from beating him. But his partners you know, stopped him because, because like even though he wasn't doing it himself, he defended it, their actions. Mm. Mm -hmm. wow. And so, even though they did, and so then after that, the two cops took took the governor to the to a dock where they stuck him, him with a bunch of heroin because they wanted to ruin his reputation. And so they drove his car off the docks, docks to make it look like a drug-induced accident. And then after that, the, the rookie cop who is now who is now jobless is trying to 
the dog. Like he gets visions from the from the governor, who I think his name was Morehouse or something. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, after that, he gets visions from him telling him to bring the cops to him. And so he brings them to his, brings them to the graveyard, which they which the free cops they 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 disgrace by peeing all over his grave. However, so, when the first I one comes comes, he gets pulled him into the grave and the zombie Morehouse, he kills them all. But then like he still attacks the he still attacks the rookie cop because he did not do anything about his death. He did not stop them from, you know. He still attacked him because he did not do anything to to stop his death. Thank you, David, for sharing that. So yesterday your 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 work was was uh so provocative. Um for us to talk about um, because of the because your themes are are universal themes for all people of color. Mm. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. And, um, if you haven't seen it, uh, David and everyone else, um, the Watchmen on HBO kind of has that same theme of um, corruption and things behind the scenes that are happening like that. I don't want to spoil it or anything, but I heard of that one before. Yeah, with the superheroes and stuff. So it's a pretty good one. One, you should same thing with that is the uh, check out the boys. Talks about that too. The I boys? Check. Boys, you can watch it on Amazon Prime. It got two mm. seasons. It's really good. You just check it out. All so right. So I, I have um, I have a question. I know I'm, I'm interrupting your slideshow, but we're we're talking about um, we're we're hitting the the you know the heart of the matter, right? Which is that um, there are these universal themes that carry across all different um, cultures of color. So my my question to you, Jeremy. Um, with so many themes that are similar, right? Trespassing, fear, um, slavery, oppression, loss of cultural identity, all of these, all of these themes. What is your advice to my young black artist students? If they, if these themes resonate with them, which I'm sure that they do, because mm -hmm. how can it not? It resonates with me and I'm not of color. I'm half, but you don't see that. I'm half Iranian, but regardless, what, what's your advice to, what's your advice um, for, for young artists that um, want to engage in this, in this dialogue in a creative way? Hmm. Um. Well, I suppose if I were um, giving myself uh, advice like a, to a younger version of me, I would say um, one thing I experienced growing up was that sense that I uh, <laughs> really didn't belong or I didn't really have a uh, future, um, whether that was kind of like a job or higher education or um, just like a role in society. And so that's it it's kind of sounds like a basic premise, but I would try to um, live as an artist as a way of um, kind of feeling like you belong everywhere, like you belong in places where um, political change is happening, you belong in other um, mediums, you belong in other disciplines. And so I would try to um, expose yourself to as many different ways of thinking, to as many different um, communities, um, points of view as possible. Um, because um, in my situation, in my growing up, I grew up on the Shinigak Reservation, which is so small, and um, so many of my relatives and cousins, we only, <laughs> we really only spend our time on the reservation, so it makes the world feel very small. It makes us feel like we don't belong anywhere but on this 800 square acres, and so <clears throat> I would just um, live as if you really do have a place. You do have a uh, purpose and a role. Um, don't don't limit yourself. Uh, don't turn down opportunities. Don't uh, say that you're not good enough for anything. 
So that's that's my main advice. It's huge advice. Thank you. That's that's wonderful advice. What did you do when you were in? So you grew up on a very very small community. How did you? What were some things that you did? to broaden your ways of thinking or to connect to other communities and to, um, to grow as an artist. And I mean, the, when, when you said that becoming an artist um, helped you to feel like you did belong, um, that's just beautiful. And, and what are some ways that you think our students can, can do that? Or what did you do? Hmm. Um, well, so much of my work um, reflects on my ancestry, my um, my place where I live and my ancestral homeland. And so it's really hard. Um, I think this is true for everyone. It's so hard to um, do the work sometimes when you're just there itself. So it's good to um, be able to travel, experience other places, other cultures and other people. And by doing that, you're able to um, see cultural differences, see other ways of living, other examples of how societies should be. And so um, one thing I recommend to all of you is to enroll in some of these um, kind of free up and call listings, and then um, add some of these like annual up and calls to your uh, like Google calendars or something, or just get a reminder system. What's and an open call? Oh, these uh, open calls. These are um, free artist listings for um, sometimes they're on social media. Sometimes there's websites dedicated to them, but they um, periodically send out like applications for grants, for artist residencies, for um, fellowships that allow you to travel. And there's only a handful that are like completely free and they cover everything. But um, so many people don't know about them but so many people would benefit from knowing about them. And um, like Vermont Studio Center was one that I was lucky enough to attend and that enlightened me a lot. Um, there's a huge amount upstate New York and the Hudson Valley. Um, if you're a photographer of color, um, Center for Photographer at Woodstock is a great um, potential future for you. They have a, a month residency for uh, primarily artists of color where you stay a month for free you get a stipend and all you have to do is just produce new work <laughs> um, so there's a, a lot of those opportunities I would love I would love some of those um, links that I could share with my with my students hmm, sure. uh, we're, we're running out of time unfortunately but um, I'd I'd love to let you finish your slideshow that I've totally <laughs> <laughs> I only have like two or three slides so let me see, I think we were here. Um, you probably read the text on screen, but this is the uh, Indians of all tribes occupying the island of uh, Alcatraz off the coast of uh, San Francisco, uh, California. This was uh, one of the other influences for this uh, body of work rise. And then of course the Dakota Access Pipeline protests in uh, North Dakota, um, more, more well known as the uh, water protectors. Um, this was a great um, historic moment in our country where hundreds of tribes came together for a common purpose and all they really did was came to um, occupy and um, wow. I guess you could describe it as trespassing <laughs> but um, can you tell our students what this what is the Dakota Access Pipeline because they may not be familiar oh sure this was a uh, transatlantic um, pipeline that was going from uh, Canada um, down to the uh, southern part of the, the United States. And one of the um, crossing points for the pipeline that was being constructed in uh, 2016 was um, routed to go over, um, over a waterway. And so many of these pipelines, they, um, they often have problems, they leak. If they leak into water, that water's polluted and undrinkable. And so um, originally they had it um, kind of near this white community upstream and they protested and pretty easily they got it moved down downstream um, close to where the Standing Rock um, Sioux people are uh, located. And so the um, kind of U.S. corps um, kind of agreed to that proposal. They started construction. And then in uh, 2016, um, the Standing Rock tribe kind of created this uh, open call for activism. 
and um, they had a, a camp there that uh, different tribes would come out, um, protest the construction. Uh, in this image, you can see someone is uh, chained to one of the uh, bulldozers. And so um, after months and months of occupation, the uh, courts actually took away the permit and required them to do another um, assessment of the land because not only were they um, threatening the water systems, but they were also um, desecrating sacred burial sites in North Dakota. And so um, this luckily ended in a victory, but you can just see how much work is involved in just trying to do something basic like preserve water <laughs> here in the United States. Um, uh, so much of our problems come from land exploitation and how much money can you get from uh, that. And then I just want to end on my uh, website and contact in, in case you have any questions. Um, there's my name again, Jeremy Dennis, Shinnecock Indian Nation. And then I'll uh, end slide from there. That was that was amazing. Ah, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was really good stuff. Thank you for sharing with us. Ah, uh, thank you all. Yeah, I, I always get inspired when um, the visiting artists come on Friday, and your work is really dope. That I really need to get more into my photography. Oh yeah, you should. <laughs> always encourage it. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for the link and this opportunity to share. Oh, yeah, definitely. Do, do any of my students, I know some of you have, many of you have already left to go to your period for the class and we are, we're running a little bit over, but um, I'm grateful for, that you are not going to your period four class and you're staying put for a few more minutes. Um, do any of my students have any questions for Jeremy? Any kind of question whatsoever? I'm not a student, but I wanted to know where do you purchase the book behind the dance and also what made you switch from illustration to photography? Um, well, to answer the uh, second question, I uh, switched from illustration to photography in senior year of college. I think at that point I was, um, I was really just interested in doing portraits of my friends. So I was, I was doing those in class. I was just jotting down um, kind of graffiti in my notebook. But um, when I took 35 millimeter, that was the time that I discovered this potential in photography, how you're basically at that end point of uh, doing the portrait. So that, that saved a lot of time and I love the result. And then um, I'll post in the uh, chat room how you can uh, purchase Behind the Dance. Um, it has a hard cover and soft cover uh, version. Did you start with, with with film? Um, with millimeter film? <laughs> yeah, I started with 35 uh, and darkroom in college. Was it color or, or black and white? I never got into color. It was always uh, black and white. Mm -hmm. And and now I, I, I'm guessing that you are primarily digital. Do you ever go to that large format camera that had scared you in high school? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think the largest I ever did was like three by four um, in college, but um, I think so much of the technology and the uh, emulsions and chemicals you expose yourself to are so <laughs> um, kind of so bad nowadays. So uh, I just like to plug it in the computer, edit and be done with it. Yeah. I actually used to be in the darkroom, so I actually miss doing that. Mm. <laughs> doing it oh, yeah. from scratch versus the digital. Mm hmm. Well, the editing process in the dark room is much more fun. Like I, I loved uh, spending hours processing or right. with, with digital, you kind of like, it, it's almost nowhere. <laughs> it kind of feels like. Yeah. There's no magic anymore. The magic of the dark room was cool. Yeah. How about some of my students? How about Jalen or Nicholas or Fabian? Come on, let's, let's hear a little, a little something from our students. Please, before we, before we end. What was the question again? The, the question was, I, I'd like you to, um, I'd like you to think of something that you'd like to ask Jeremy now that we've, we've got him here live. We had such, a, especially you Jalen, you had so many amazing things to say yesterday about, about his work. Can you, maybe you can share with share with Jeremy some of the observations that you made yesterday 
while looking at his work? Like what did, what did, when you looked at his photography, what did it, what did it stir up in you? How about how about the rest of you? Um, David, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? Mm, well, not really. No questions. Okay. Well, thanks for unmuting your mic for a moment. Might actually be interested in finding out. Um, how did he get the scholarship to um, pursue his photography? He said he had got $10,000. I think that was a grant probably. Yeah, he had got a grant. Like how does, how does one go about getting a grant for a you, project? You apply for them. I'll let Jeremy. Oh yeah, that was kind of like a one-off. It was uh, from a nonprofit called uh, Running Strong for American Indian Youth. So it was very specific to native uh, people, but um, if you have a really ambitious project and you have a clear goal, you know how the money is going to be spent. Um, I think that's really the main um, things that you need to have. And then there are very competitive grants that each year they're open to the uh, public and you can make proposals that way. Like uh, Creative Capital is a good example. Um, there's a bunch of them um, in that same realm, but unless you have like a very uh, important mission or um, a very specific and clear goal. Um, they often turn down applications. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm so grateful um, for your time and, and sharing your work with us. Thank and you, that was awesome. <laughs> yes, thank you for coming. Sorry right. for the technical difficulties in the beginning. Um, and uh, we look forward to yeah, thank you for coming. And I purchased the book on Blurb. Oh, thank you, that's awesome. You're welcome. <laughs> well, it was an honor to present to you all, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. I'll be in touch. All right, okay, have a good day, everyone. Bye.